cars are the finest exhibition of horsepower and speed going right now. We like funny cars because they're fast. There's a lot of action. Power. Lots of horsepower, real yeah. fast. They're wrathful, they're really I like that. Looking. Yeah, they're just ground shaking. They shake, they rattle, and occasionally roll. They're the most violent, unpredictable racing machines man has yet conceived. Funny cars, floppers, plastic fantastics, call them what you will, but they're five second, 260 mile an hour combat packs that grandstands like no other breed. The Mount St. Helens of the quarter mile. Their roots are the stock cars of the early 60s that sent many a loyal dragster fan to the hot dog stand. They said race cars don't have doors. Then something funny happened. The stock cars started doing wheel stands. Street cars didn't do that. Then a blower or two showed up on full-bodied steel cars and they got even funnier. That funny is in peculiar. Suddenly the fans were cheering wildly for the Dodge, the Ford, the Chevy, whatever they own. Product identity, some trackside psychologist said. Then came nitro, plastic bodies, tube frames, and a troupe of touring stars with colorful nicknames. They blazed the tires across the continent, leaving some legendary stories in their wake. When NHRA accepted them as a real racing class, the unfortunate name had stuck, Funny Cars. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Evans. As I'm sure you've already figured out, the focus of our show is the funny car class of championship drag racing. And who better to talk about the past, the present, and even the future of funny car racing than two men who have both earned world championship status. Kenny Bernstein, the Budweiser King. Hi Steve. And, of course, Don the Snake Prudhomme. Snake? A Steve. Kenny, first of all, thanks for inviting us into your shop. It's really some place. Well, I'm glad for you to be here, Steve. You and Don both, and we're proud to be here in Orange, California. Transplanted Texan to come out here to the West Coast, which many people have done. But it's a nice place, offices, 10,000 square feet. We're glad to call it home. And Snake, the second order of business. We should uh, explain to everyone, but that term floppers is kind of a hardcore inside term. Well, Steve, don't blame it on us. It's you announcers, I believe, that came up with that. I believe it's an abbreviation <laughs> of fender floppers, someone said one time. Uh, wait, are you guys ready to talk about what you do best, Bunny Car Racing? Sure. Absolutely. Let's, Let's do Let's it. get comfortable. We right. got it. Hey, you guys. The other day, I read in the paper that they dug up an old race car at Lyons Drag Strip that is now closed. You know, in the article, the gentleman that wrote it seemed a little confused. He said it was a funny car, like a stock car. Well, you guys were too busy flogging your top field dragsters in those days to maybe know what was going on, because the funny car really did start as a stock car. In fact, an old pal of yours, Dick Landy, was one of the first. He kind of altered the wheelbase, and the car started carrying the front end off the starting line, and the people went nuts, and that's really where it came from. The first funny cars, like this one at Dick Landy, were not built from the ground up. They were modified A factory experimental cars, an official NHRA class that had strong factory participation. Ford ran their single overhead cam racing engine here, uh, later their famed shotgun Hemi, of course Chrysler Corporation with its Hemi and all of the big block Chevrolets. The factories were actually using hot rodders all over the country as R&D contract specialists, coming up with exciting new projects from carburetors to camshafts. 
The racing was close and exciting, and many a fan thrived on it. But for these drivers, the rules were a little too restrictive. They wanted to go quicker and faster no matter what the rules were. And the first modification they made was to the wheelbase, moving that rear axle forward for better weight transfer. At first, just a few inches. By 1965, the wheelbase had been altered a foot and a half. Suddenly, carburetors were replaced with fuel injectors poking through the steel hoods. Roll bars had been installed, and in some of the tanks, nitromethane instead of gasoline. Well, the next logical step, superchargers. And suddenly, these cars took on their own identity, funny cars. By 1965, some real innovations started to appear, such as lightweight flip-top fiberglass bodies. They greatly reduced the weight of the automobile while still maintaining the look of a Detroit product. Gone were the stock frames. Now it was chrome molly tubular steel, which not only made the cars quicker and faster, but they handled better and were safer. And now that the funny car was a true racing machine, it was time for a dose of showbiz, the crowd-pleasing burnout and its greatest practitioner, the famed Chi-Town Hustler. Now, the burnout was originally a performance tool. It was uh, done just to put a little rubber down on the racetrack, get the tires good and hot, but the crowd reacted wildly, and soon drivers were trying to outdo one another for the fans' attentions, and of course, the promoters, who booked in these cars to put on nothing more than a drag racing show. Strong personalities surfaced, supported by almost cult-like fans, and soon rivalries developed, real or imagined, and that formed the basis for many an exciting match race. You could hardly turn on a rock and roll radio station without hearing three announcers screaming, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. In 1970, the National Hot Rod Association legitimized the cars by creating a separate funny car eliminator on the national event tour. And suddenly these cars were exposed to television, to ever-growing crowds, to sponsors, and a professional form of motorsports had arrived. You know, I guess in professional sports, the Chicago Bears football team started it, but it seems like everybody in sports is making a music video. Well, we're no exception. Take a look at what we call the flip-top shuffle. When we were putting that uh, little video together in the studio, it constantly reminded you that uh, the body is the most distinctive part of the funny car. You're right, Steve. Uh, Irwindale drag strip. I happened to be there when Dinal Don Nicholson was debuting his Ford uh, flip-top funny car. It's the first body that we had seen in those days that they actually came up uh, that you lifted from the front, which we called the flip-top funny car. In fact, I remember that night he won Best Engineered Car, and they presented the award on the starting line. He got in, and the body blew off halfway down the racetrack. It was a mercury body <laughs> car. So. That's right. It was one of those unfortunate things that do happen to these funny cars, as you well know. And the altitude record for a body launch was set at Fremont Raceway by Joe Winter. Yeah, that's an example, Steve, of just what we were talking about, uh, how these funny car bodies can get airborne uh, when, the, when there's an explosion of some sort. And uh, I think he lost a body latch or something at that time. I don't, I don't really see an explosion. 
At Fremont in those days, uh, they would actually break the body up into little bitty pieces and sell them for souvenirs to help the guy buy a new body. In 1970, Paul Smith went for a wild ride, Kenny. Oh, he did. He had his hands full. Obviously, he picked the front end up, as you could see, leaving the starting line. Went up, came back down. He got back in again in the throttle and up again, and it threw the body right off the car. And that was just a situation there of having your hands full and really not aborting a run when you should have early. Yeah, Kenny, but I think we're all guilty of that. When you're on a good run, it's just hard to lift. And in Paul's case there, it was doing a wheel stand, setting it down, didn't want to abort the run, and I believe it just got too much air up underneath the body. Well, Snake, you had the best seat in the house at the 75 Spring Nationals, Raymond Beetle. It was in the final round. I was racing Raymond. He was off on a heck of a run. His car was started carrying the front end, and I could see it out the corner of my eye. I thought, boy, when's he going to lift? Boy, I'm telling you, he got it up, too. It went up, and just like you said before, Snake, the wind got the body, and off she came, and out the parachute comes. At the 84 Gators, it was Ron Carreni who found yet another way to shed a body, Kenny. Oh, he sure did. And a tremendous blower explosion right off the starting line, blowing the blower concussion style right off the body, right off the car, by just like a big firecracker going off in a can. Boy, in the early days, there were some goofy bodies out there. There were Jeep-bodied cars, oh, topless yeah. cars. Oh, I remember seeing the Destroyer Jeep over in Phoenix, Arizona. I thought it was fantastic. But you know, it's all changed today, and obviously it's more sophisticated and updated to what is now today the funny car, the long, sleek, narrow-type funny car that has the aerodynamics that you have to have to go 260 miles an hour. In those early days, it was crude. It was the first time around. But since then, all of us have been able to go into the wind tunnel at Marietta, Georgia, and look at the cars and see what the wind does. Mm -hmm. Consequently, the long, sleek, aerodynamic funny cars prevailed. i got to give credit to the snake here for a lot of that, because that first Pontiac <laughs> car of yours was about the slipperiest thing we'd ever seen. Well, it, it was. Uh, Pontiac did come up with an awfully sl uh, slick car in, in the first of the 80s here, and, uh, and today that body style is still stands true to, to be the fastest car in the quarter mile. And the GM engineers got involved in that project. It wasn't just something you did. Well, they sure did, Steve, but you know, much before that, we didn't know anything about aerodynamics. Uh, it was just all trial and error with these flip-top bodies. Oh, absolutely. The air is so important on these cars, and just like Don said, none of us really knew what it did. We just assumed that it did certain things. We thought this is what took place, but we weren't obviously sure when we went to the wind tunnel with Ford and the special vehicle operations and looked at it and saw what happened you could finally see what the wind does to the car and where you could take advantages of that wind really the difference between the 250 and 260 that happened almost overnight was there really aerodynamics it wasn't as much horsepower right then as it was aerodynamics Well, there were some cars out there that the word funny did a We mentioned earlier those first funny cars were all steel stock bodies, uh, but suddenly, mainly in the interest of white, things started to change. Well, sure, uh, fiberglass, of course, came into play. Uh, matter of fact, Don Nicholson's car, like we pointed out, was a fiberglass car. But the uh, funny car bodies today are, are much the same. Uh, they, there's some material changes, but for the most part, majority of the cars are still fiberglass. Mm -hmm. And Kenny, you've experimented with some other materials. Yes, we have. We've moved into the area of, of carbon fiber, which is a little lighter and a lot stronger than just normal fiberglass. It's a little harder to work with for, for the people that are building the cars, but it does give some advantage. The real uh, advantage we like, besides the weight savings, is it, it holds its contour of the car. It doesn't collapse uh, during the run itself at 260 miles an hour as quickly as a fiberglass car does. 
but on the other hand, it's awfully expensive. It's about twice the, the cost of a fiberglass body. When I started out and you got the McEwens, the Perdomes, the McCulloughs, you got people like that, uh, they're a different breed, I think. I think that those people, uh, you're, that when they were on Earth before, they might have been gladiators or gypsies or hell's angels or something. I don't know because we've had some times and as we've gone around the country, been involved in deals and I mean, it, that would be another story, you know, you couldn't print that probably, but I mean, it's a just something in their makeup. I think they could, they would probably could have been maybe astronauts or uh, things don't, we don't get scared real easy with stuff, just like uh, Daredevil. I don't know, it's just, but you're right about that. There's a few of them around in the funny car ranks that are a little bit different and uh, they've got uh, funny personalities and they'll do things that most people won't do and they're kind of a, a group of their own. I see myself as a racer. Uh, I picked up the Knicks name, the Snake, and of course the Mongoose. Uh, we had a little thing going between us that, uh, that, that did well for us. Of course, that started out in 1970 with Mattel Hot Wheels. McEwen was more of the showman. Mm -hmm. I kind of was more of the racer, and today I, I think I'm still the same way. I, I, I enjoy the, the workings of the machine, the aerodynamics of it, and of course driving the car. Uh, the showman part, uh, I, I left that up to the mongoose. Well, first I think the showman side of it in today's funny car has diminished a lot. It, it is a business today. It's a, a way that we make a living mm -hmm. and we have to run for sponsors and do things for them. So the showman side is kind of over. It's neat to still have the names around, the snake and the mongoose, and to see those, the ace, McCulloch. Mm -hmm. I like that but you don't see that happening anymore as you did in the early days but as far as as, as myself and the Budweiser King I think uh, the people look at the Budweiser King and myself as, as business and a racer at the same time I, I hope that's what it is and that we're out there trying to to do the best we can to win races and a championship that's what it's all about when you get down to it that was just great back in the old days. I mean, I used to almost look forward to staying up all night and working on stuff and getting in the truck and heading down the road and talking on the CB radio. And, you know, it just seemed like this was a certain amount of, of glamour in having to be at a different end of the country each day of the week and run the car. And it was almost some kind of an Iron Man test, like you really felt good if you pulled it all off without having to surrender. Yeah, guys used to pride themselves on how many dates they could run that year. Not how few dates, but how many dates. And, uh, uh, you know, I think Jungle... Those crazy, wonderful match race days of the 70s, when you ran two, three, even four times a week, the driver's personalities really surfaced, almost like wrestling today. And at the top of that list, I know you guys will agree, Jungle, Jungle Jim, Jim Lieberman. Lieberman. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, who can't forget Jungle? He, uh, he was the greatest of all uh, in those days, he, uh, he was tremendous. That guy uh, ran more dates. I think I heard one time he ran over 100 dates in one year. Uh, he did have a couple of funny cars. He would jump from track to track and run all over the states running those things. Well, he'd book the same night at five different tracks. He drove the promoters <laughs> crazy. You know, he was making sure it didn't rain somewhere so he could get to the next one. Now, he was a true showman. He was probably the first showman of the sport in the funny car side that I remember growing up and reading and seeing Jungle Jim, but what a guy. And of course the fans enjoyed Jungle Pam out there lining that car <laughs> Oh, that was part of it. Yeah.
One of the first funny car personalities was Dandy Dick Landy, who could go through a box of cigars a day without ever lighting up. We raced them mainly uh, uh, what we call match racing. That's where the match racing started. There'd be two cars, three cars, or four car shows, and we'd go into a racetrack. And it was fantastic. The Ford, Chevrolet, Bill Jenkins, uh, uh, the Landys, our Sox and Martins, having these match races. And uh, boy, it was just unbelievable. They thought nothing to get six, 7,000 people out there just to watch a, a tour, two to four of us race. A true innovator was Dino Don Nicholson, the first to use the soft butyl rubber rear tires, one of the first to use a custom-made tubular exhaust system. He achieved his early fame with Chevrolet, but later established a strong relationship with the Mercury division of the Ford Motor Company. That culminated with Eliminator One. That was the first flip-top funny car ever built by anyone. And, uh, of course, it uh, was a forerunner of what we see now in the funny cars. And uh, we had, uh, we won as many as uh, 39 races in a row with that thing without ever losing one. 68, uh, we finally decided we were going to have to go to the supercharged cars to keep up. We, uh, the tires were getting better and more horsepower, and, uh, and uh, the supercharged cars definitely were the way to go in 68. Well, with those superchargers, we are getting a lot of fires. A lot of guys were getting burnt, and uh, I felt like that without the onboard fire, fire equipment that we got now on the cars, they just weren't safe enough to drive. And, uh, NHRA, uh, I think, kind of seen the handwriting on the wall, and they come back with a pro-stock class force in in uh, 1970. One of the toughest men, mentally and physically, to ever sit behind the wheel of a funny car, Ed the Ace McCullough. Art Whipple and myself, my former partner, uh, we started out on our own money in the, in the early 70s, 1969, and then in 1970, and we ran the car, you know, on our own, just independent. Uh, we ran through 70 in 1971. Uh, we put a deal together with the Revell Toy Company. We started our professional tour uh, and we run all of the national events across the United States and match race, you know, on the off weeks in between time. Probably the highs in, in in uh, drag racing or when you're on race day and you're out there and you're winning your rounds. You know, you get by first round and it's always a little bit tense. Uh, you know, your anticipation and, and in the build up, you get that first round under your belt and then you just get tougher from there. And I mean, when you get to the last round and you, you know, you get to the finish line, that's probably the all time high right there to be ahead of the guy at the finish line in the last round. I do remember the first funny car I got in, Ray Alley's purple Cuda, and it scared me to death. When they put the body down, I thought I was in a coffin. It was really kind of almost like a lark. I had been doing top fuel just as Don back in Texas, not on the major sure. uh, fake aid such as uh, the snake over here, but I was having a good time with it. I came out to visit Ray Alley, and he said, well, how would you like to drive this thing? And I fell in love with it. I think it was the fact that you did the burnouts and you got the backup and you did another burnout and all those things that we weren't doing in top fuel at that time, and it was fun. Well, a lot of drivers, like you guys, deserted the top fuel ranks and went into funny car competition. But there's a couple who started with funny cars and decided to go the other way, back to top fuel dragsters. And no one's having more fun doing it than gentleman Gene Snow from Fort Worth, Texas. Now, a lot of people will argue with you. They'll tell you Gene Snow is the true father of the funny car. The snowman enjoyed many seasons of success until retiring to drill for oil in his native Texas, and he found plenty of it. And Gene was the first to bring a funny car to NHRA national events. And they said, but Gene, uh, we don't have a class for you. How about you're a sea fuel dragster? So he had to race the rail jobs, the roadsters, all kinds of machines, unlike his own full-bodied steel car, and he whipped them two consecutive years at the U.S. Nationals, as a matter of fact, and the funny car racers all over the country can maybe thank Gene Snow for bringing the class to the attention of NHRA and legitimizing it finally. And it was only appropriate that in 1970, Gene Snow was the NHRA funny car world champion. Snow at one time ran as many as three cars on the match race circuit, giving a lot of young drivers a chance at stardom.
one of the most famous top fuel dragster personalities and the only driver to win three NHRA World Championships actually started a professional career at the wheel of a funny car. In those days, she was known as Cha-Cha. Shirley Muldowney teamed up with Connie Coletta. She was a very popular attraction on the Matry circuit all over the country. But at the U.S. Nationals, she got singed a bit in a funny car fire, and she said, you know what, I'm too damn pretty to get burned up like this, and decided to sit in front of the motor where she was more comfortable. But it all began with funny cars. The drivers were important, as you know, but in one case in particular, the car was by far the most important thing. The shy town hustler. Oh, indeed. Anybody could drive that car, and the promoters would book it, and the fans would go nuts. You bet. They really enjoyed it, the smoky burnouts from one end to the other. As long as you could do that, you had the shy town hustler. The smoky burnout thing, we actually initiated that uh, because we felt that if we really smoked the tires hard and got them hot, that we could improve the traction. And like, as a, a tuner and engine builder myself, I, I almost have some regrets that we were known so much for the smoky burnout when back in those days we were also just a little bit faster than all our competition as well. Chi-Town Hustler name, we sat in the garage for hours trying to come up with a name. And in the past years, my partners, Farconis and Minnick, had had some cars called the Hustler, but we figured that just wasn't enough. And that Chicago being so notorious for perhaps gangsters in the past, that you know we felt that relating it to that would be a good idea. And one of us, I don't think anyone really remembers who said, well, how about Chi-Town Hustler? And we said, okay, let's try it. It uh, seems that back in those days, people were very attuned to the name of a car, like the snake was well known when perhaps maybe they didn't even know his name was Don for Dome. And the Chi Town Hustler was well known when no one knew my name or Pat Minnick's name or Farconis's name. But it appeared that like one had to do something. It had to be long, smoky burnouts or perhaps turning around and driving back to the starting line. All these things seem to get a lot more attention than a low ET time slip. How does a youngster get a ride in a famous funny car like the Chi-Town Hustler? Well, in 1981, Canadian sportsman driver Frank Hawley took a unique approach. Frank sent us a resume and uh, proclaimed to have all of the ingredients needed to become a top driver one of them being that he was willing to work on the car and another drive the truck and uh, another was low wages would be acceptable and we figured we'd give him a try. Certainly, you know, since television media has become prominent in drag racing, why, you know, the Frank Hawley's uh, World Championships in 82 and 83 were our most memorable years. Oh, I appreciate it. Oh, thank heaven for some of them. <laughs> Takes that kind of money to be able to do this kind of racing, and it's uh, without the people like Chief and Sid going seven eleven and Valvoline, you just can't do it. Paul Candice, congratulations. Thank you, thank you. Fine young man. Here. My guys did a great job. Best team in drag racing. It doesn't get any better than this. I saw him right next to me, and I knew he was close to it, and I figured that if that, as close as he was to me, I knew he probably had to be over, but it didn't matter. The Budweiser King Motorcraft Tempo was on the wood. <laughs> nice watch, Steve. Well, thank you, Snake. It's the choice of a new generation. Was it expensive? Well, kind of, but I got on this special plan. You, know, you can pay me now or pay me later. From the looks of it, quality is always job one. By the way, Kenny, how come you always look so fresh? Well, nothing keeps you revving like 7-Eleven. If you ask me, it doesn't get any better than this. Unless you go Hawaiian. <laughs> well, Kenny, before I forget, this bud's for you. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give the sponsors their due.
During the heyday of the funny car match race circuit, I was the editor of National Dragster, and every Monday morning I would get the damage report from across the country. Russell Long hit a pole at US 30. Jungle ran off the end and into a farmer's barn. Mighty Mike Van Sant burned to the ground in the middle of the track in Puyallup. Boy, I'll tell you, those cars were scary. Well, they were then, and they still are to some extent, even though they're sophisticated, and then there are missiles and rockets today that we uh, take care of properly, but there are things that can happen still. And probably the most dangerous, the one that scares the driver the most, is a blower explosion, mm -hmm. where the blower, the supercharger on top of the engine, actually comes off the car. It distorts the vision. It puts the windshield and the tin back in the driver's face. And he's really just hanging on for dear life, so to speak, trying to maintain control. What causes that is usually an intake valve hangs mm -hmm. open, sets off an explosion, and it's a, it's a tremendous explosion. Of course, you can go further and have a, a rod come out the side of, a, of an engine block and put oil on the headers. That causes a fire to start, and that's probably the most severe that we face the most that we don't like is the fire because it's hot and intense inside. You can't get away from it. There's nowhere to go. You're strapped in. You're still going 250 miles an hour, and you can't wait for it to stop. So there's a lot of danger to it, but there's a lot of safety to that make it, not, make it good for you also. Even though you're going faster and quicker and the blower explosions are more violent now, more guys walk away unscathed than did in the old days. Well, certainly. Uh, but, you know, you really have to thank NHRA for that, I, I have to say, because they, they've done a great, great deal of uh, work in that department. Uh, the fire suits were the first main thing. You know, we lost a good friend, John Mulliken, many, many years back uh, because of fire. We learned a lot from them. People like Bill Simpson and Deese came out with fire suits that uh, really helped protect these drivers. Fire boots, the gloves, the equipment uh, is second to none in racing. And let's not forget the onboard fire extinguisher. Well, it's obvious what Don said. In HRA, we can thank a lot for that safety. The front brakes are one, the dual parachutes, the sure. Nomex underwear from Simpson, the, from the socks all the way to the head stocking, the gloves, everything that it takes to keep you safe in the car. The roll cages in the cars, which is really the most mandatory thing that we have. Again, there's a design there that has to be met, a specification that that roll cage has to be intact. And if you'll notice in most crashes, that roll cage is always there and the driver is safe, and that's very important. You know, recently at the uh, Winter Nationals, Ed McCullough, he had a bad one. Right. And I got to think the front brakes, which are now mandatory, uh, really helped keep him in one piece. He was able to stop that car so the safety safari could get at it. That's right. Uh, our car was one of the first cars with uh, front brakes. Uh, we learned that in a match race in Milan, Michigan. Uh, I lost a parachute. The car started bouncing, getting out of control at the other end of the track. And after reviewing the films, uh, we saw that the front wheels were on the ground and the back, big balloon back tire started bouncing. If I'd have had front brakes on there, I could have stopped the car. The main thing, I mean, I knew I knew the pulley was alongside somewhere, and I knew the guardrail was on the other somewhere, you know, and anything in between, I was trying to stay away from both of them. Uh, I left my visor down until the flame went out, and obviously it was, you know, oiled and burnt, and I, I couldn't see, and finally I lifted the visor up enough that I could see where I was going, and then, it, you know, at that point I knew I was going to be okay. And anybody who thinks a funny car doesn't need a driver aboard didn't see Tom Anderson at the 83 Gators. Watch this. Again, and he's on fire just as we've seen before. The blower sitting up on top of the windshield, Don. Yeah, well, that's what happens, Kenny, of course. Uh, as you well know, when you lose the blower, it, uh, it'll pop up on you like that. But the oil that's burning underneath the car, it, it probably threw a rod out at the same time. It just keeps pouring oil. There's like 12 quarts of oil in these engines. It just keeps pouring out underneath the car. Well, he's got a good one going. The main problem I saw there, the parachutes never blossomed. They never opened up to give him a good chance to stop in, in, a, in a hurry. And it's at moments like these that drivers like Tom Anderson are darn glad that there's a safety hatch in the roof of that funny car. Coming out the side windows is a lot harder to do than this kind of an exit, Kenny. It sure is. It's a lot easier coming out the top, and obviously he got out in a hurry. And the fire suit, uh, you could smell it burning down there at the other end of the racetrack, but he was okay. Now, Al Segrini always picks the Winter Nationals in his theatrics, and this was 85. Yeah, that was on the final. He blew up.
a clutch. Uh, unlike the blower explosion or uh, throwing a rod out, he blew a clutch out of the car. So there's other there's things that can happen in these cars besides blowing the engine up. What were all the sparks? Well, it was the pieces from the clutch uh, getting loose and tearing up the bell housing. Uh, uh, I don't believe too many of the parts came inside the car, but it looked like it all went out the bottom. Obviously, the clutch has come out like Don says, and you don't think it's as bad as a blower explosion right there, but take a look at this shot and you'll see that Al Segrini at this particular instant can't see anything and, and, and eventually crosses the center line. And in the gathering darkness, that was quite a sight, but one I'd just as soon not see again. At the 80 Gators, we saw just how difficult these cars can be to control. Lennon Brogno into the fence. And if you notice that flash off your screen there, it's the fireball that shot off the car, uh, along with the right front tire. What you see right now is burning is the, uh, the fuel tank. Uh, he's not in any danger at all. It was veering, I guess. It got out of its tracks, and as soon as it got out of its track a little bit, it went right into the guardrail just as I shifted it. So. And once you had the, you hit the road, you had no steering. How close did you come to Costi Ivanov? Uh, I didn't even see Costi. I tried to keep it, you know, everything to this side as much as possible. I don't remember seeing Costi at all. Okay, well, our condolences on the loss of a fine race car, but you're okay, and that's what really counts. Thank you, Steve. So it was the hook for Lynn and Brogno at the 1980 Gator Nationals. At the 1984 World Finals, Billy Williams showed us how to chop the top on a funny car. He sure did, and right in the lights he did. It exploded, blower explosion, bottom and top it looked like, and it completely demolished this race car. And this was Billy's first time out in a nitro funny car. It got his attention, Snake. Sure, and as you notice, it lost the windshield first, and there goes the top. What on earth happened? I've never seen one like that. I have no idea myself. It just seemed like it must have started to get lean because the car really started to run good down here. It felt like it really started to pick up and then all of a sudden just boom. And uh, your first experience with a funny car so far certainly has not been a pleasant one. It hasn't been great. I like it though. It's neat. I'll get used to it. You'll be back. Yeah, I'll be back. There was one driver I wondered if I would see back and that was Bob Gottschalk at the 85 Gator Nationals on fire. He can't see like a runaway chainsaw into the tender dry woods. Suffered some burns on my hands and on the tops of my feet, but other than that. Well, Snake, hard to say which came first, the blower explosion or a broken rod. It's another bad one. Uh, it's his first experience on nitro methane, and uh, it's quite a lesson to go through. Oh, it's a hot one too, Don, and he lost the parachutes on this car, much like Tom Anderson did on his. I believe the fire uh, burned out the right rear slick on it, too, and it, uh, it was given up as it was going off into the weeds. And I'll tell you, the fire in the woods was just instantaneous. Yeah, Steve, but you know, uh, too bad they didn't have a guardrail there now, and, and I, they do at that particular track. They have a guardrail at the end, so, so that doesn't happen again. That last fire right there that really happened was, was the uh, fuel tank exploding, uh, Steve. And amazingly, a member of the NHRA Safety Safari, who always wears a fireproof suit, went into the woods and got that man out. Was there a funny car that you had that you, looking back, you wonder, why did I ever drive that? Yeah, that happened to me at uh, Seattle Raceway at, uh, in the lights. When it uh, flew. It flew. It took off. That was one of the first big fires that we had in the sport, and it was my Hot Wheels car. It caught on fire in the lights, and it actually took off the front end race, and, the, and it cleared the lights at the end of the course, and, and of course blew the body off, and it was a tremendous fire. Well, I was in the tower, and the clocks didn't stop. And I couldn't figure out why. <laughs> he was over Until later I saw the, a picture of it, and it flew completely flying. over the track. But in those days, it was trial and error. We didn't know anything about aerodynamics, and, and who knows what would happen with the fire. And therefore, I found out it was an unfortunate <laughs> thing, but you know, a lot of guys experience things like that, and that's where mm -hmm. we're at today with the safer car. Well, I certainly have felt from time to time in the early beginning when I came back to racing in the early 80s, 1978, 79, and 80, and I had been out of it a while, and I had my hands full at Orange County Raceway. As you remember, Steve, I must have made 40 runs over there and never made it down the quarter mile. I hit every guardrail there was. Poor Mr. Donor had to repair a guardrail every time Kenny came out there, and I didn't know if I should be in that race car or not. <laughs> Believe me, I didn't know if this is what I wanted to do or, or not at that time. Was there actually a point where you thought maybe 
I you want to do this? Well, I did. I thought two things at a particular time. I thought, one, maybe I didn't want to, and two is maybe I couldn't. Maybe I had grown past the stage of being able to do it. But uh, fortunately, uh, I stuck it out and uh, got some help from some friends of mine that, that gave me some good advice. I finally made it through there, and everything turned out fine. But you bet. I thought for a while, no, nah, this isn't me. I better go back to, to doing sandwiches in the restaurants. <laughs> But you don't have to tear them up, you don't have to burn them up to be exciting. Uh, this is what we come to the drag races for, is to see two good cars run down the track side by side, Tom McEwen and Kenny Bernstein. This was the 86 Gator Nationals, and Kenny, what a close race it was. Oh, it was. It was so close, I, I didn't know who won at the end. And I can tell you that neither did Tom McEwen. That's what drag racing's all about. The burnout isn't that easy to do, Steve. You know, you, you can't over-rev the engine. you got to go into it uh, just right so you don't get too many R's going. Obviously, we used to do those things for a lot of looks, but today it's really to make the cars go quicker, get the tires nice and hot. But the starting line, that's where the driver earns his money. Oh, absolutely. If you don't get off the starting line on time, it, you're going to lose, just like I did to McEwen. Is there a trick to staging, Don? Sure there is. Uh, you don't want to stage too deep, and you just want to keep your uh, cool there and collect your thoughts. The concentration level is very high there, and you have to leave on the yellow. The last yellow is your starting, not the green. I've noticed with both of you guys, when you win a close race, the adrenaline is really pumping, uh, and not when, uh, when it's a runaway. Sure, when you step out of the car, you're, you're real excited, you know. You, obviously, you'd be real excited if you win the race, but uh, it, just at the same time, you know, traveling 1,320 feet at 260 miles an hour is a, is a thrill in itself. Head-to-head -head competition, no second chances, let the best driver win. That's what the fans like about funny car racing. Well, you know, drag racing is one of the luckiest sports in the world. It allows the spectators to come to the pits and watch us work on our cars. It's a show in itself. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, and what you're doing in the pits is, uh, is servicing the engine. After each and every run, that engine has to be taken apart. You know, Steve, we're talking some 2,500 horsepower these things are putting out, and each little piece has to be looked at, and, of course, especially the pistons. There's a piston uh, change going on in the pits usually. And also the bottom end of the engine. Yeah, well, you're searching out for anything that's wrong with the engine. It, we're there to prepare it for the next run. We can't go to the starting line with something that is not 100% or you can't win. So we're all geared, our trucks and trailers and our crew are geared to take it completely apart, inspect it, and put it back together in its best form that is possible to go win a race. How quick can your crew chief, Bob Brandt, get all that done? From the time it arrives back in the pits after a run, it takes from about 45 minutes to an hour. That's pretty quick. How about Dale Armstrong and his guys? Basically the same thing, depending on the damage. 45 minutes is on the short side, an hour on the long side. Well, no one works harder and pushes his crew any harder than Roland Leon. Yeah. You know that. What if I told you Roland and his guys can do it in uh, two minutes? I'd like to see <laughs> oh, that. No way. <laughs> Take a look. Now that's a speed secret. Well, someone once said if Roland had a uh, driver's reunion, it'd have to be in the Astrodome. <laughs> yeah, and I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't made it over there yet, no. <laughs> but there's a lot of them.
I drove a gas dragster back in uh, 1963. Uh, then I drove a fuel car in 1964, which I crashed. After that, I hired Don Perdone. I thought he'd be a better bet to be a driver than I was. And that's the way it all got started. And we raced a dragster for over oh, four years. I could see that we match raced the dragster all over the country, of course, just like we do the funny cars now. But then the, the dragsters were getting kind of scarce as far as uh, getting match races to make a living. So, and it seemed like the funny cars were the ones that were getting all the dates. So that's, in 1969, I decided to build a funny car. We didn't think the transition would, would be any problem. Uh, as it was, it was a lot of problem. The first weekend we ran the car, the car flew, uh, and we crashed winning the first round at the Winter Nationals in 1969. So there are a lot of things that were different about dragsters and funny cars that we had to learn. I rebuilt the car and went on the road with it back east, raced the rest of the season. We came back in 1970 with this new car that we ran for half the season and won the Winter Nationals again in that year, 1970. Then in 71, uh, uh, I had a fellow by the name of Butch Moss driving and we won the Winter Nationals again in 1971. So I guess, uh, like anything else, within the last uh, little over 20 years, uh, I had my ups and downs. Texas was very prominent in the funny car ranks in the early days, and the main car out of Texas that probably set it on the map to begin with was the Blue Max with Raymond Beetle, oh, the late owner, but in the beginning, the Harry Schmidt car when he owned it at the start of, of the time. And I remember having my shop on Rita Road in Dallas, Texas, mm -hmm. next door to the Blue Max, and Mike Burkhardt, and of course, Gene Snow, the snowman who was dominant in those days also. And the first weekend that Blue Max went out, this was a brand new car. An unknown driver went 202 miles an hour at Sears Point, and that started the, the Blue Max era. But the pre-Beetle days, Tharp had to be the star. <laughs> He's maybe the one that really made the Blue Max as popular with the fans as it was. Yeah, well, Thorp was kind of a jungle gem Lieberman as a driver. He was a real colorful guy, and he'd, he'd spin the car out the end of the track and jump out of it and uh, raise all kind of heck, as we all well know. Mm -hmm. Well, Richard, of course, was. Uh, Jake Johnson did a, a super beautiful job with the car. Probably won more at that particular stage of, of time with Jake in the car, but Richard was always the character, and uh, he probably brought the Boomax to the forefront in that animal. And then, of course, uh, Raymond then took in, uh, came in with Harry and became a driver and a part owner, and then actually bought Harry out and, and really started the, the process. That wasn't good news for you when Raymond Beetle bought out the Blue Max. No, it, it wasn't. Uh, Beetle <laughs> really took off. He attacked drag racing like he does everything else. And of course, he had a great crew. He had Dale Emery and Waterbed Fred, who's a colorful guy yeah. in himself. And, you know, speaking of uh, changing engines, those boys could take it apart and put it together. Well, they won three world championships. But the moment I remember most, I think, had to be at Gainesville, Florida, at the Gator Nationals, when that thing flipped upside down. And he was still trying to drive it upside down. <laughs> yes, I remember that well too. He got out of control and it hit the guardrail and spun upside down. I think I think it scared uh, everyone else more than it did it. Well, the thing I remember about that the most is when Raymond got out, he put his arms up in the air and waved to the crowd as if he was a champion. He did it. You bet. That's what I always said. All we needed was a theme from Rocky Amen. to go underneath <laughs> that to make it work. Yeah, that's right. It was a heck of a car, and it is still today. Obviously, uh, Raymond's out of the seat now. He's taking care of business across the board in NASCAR and in drag racing. And uh, he has Don Lombardo in the car as a driver. And uh, of course, Dale Emery and Waterbed are, are still there uh, taking care of the car and the wrenches. And the, when that car pulls to the starting line, there's no doubt that it's capable of putting down low elapsed time of the event anytime it's there. And another case where the car is the star. Blue Max.
you've had many, many big wins in your career, and nobody's probably ever going to come close to that. And I, you know, and I've won a few times, and they meant a lot to me. But the one, uh, the one that really got me, and I'm, and I know you got you too at the time, was uh, right after Jamie passed on you know in 78 you know and, I, and he'd had leukemia for like almost two years and mm -hmm. I was going back and forth to be with him as much as I could and uh, mm -hmm. trying to maintain you know and uh, and I know that uh, you and Lynn were real real helpful at the time and he liked you a lot you know and uh, we went back there and uh, went into that race and to come down with you and I in the final at India the big deal on TV you know and uh, I remember uh, that he told me, the, one of the last things he told me in the hospital was, uh, you know, he, he knew that race was coming because he wanted to go, you know. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, go go do good for me at the race. And then we got to the race and went yeah. through it. And then fortunate enough to beat you in the final. And at the end, I pulled off on the grass. And Christ, I was crying. I couldn't even get out of my car. And you came over there. And I mean, it was real. I, you know, that's something that's uh, yeah, you know, touching I, for me. Yeah. I, I relived that race a, a number of times, too. and. Um, uh, uh, you, you know, we were running quite well uh, during the event. Oh, I mean, we were a little qualifier. Sure, we had every, every round. Everything going our way. Yeah. And you got a single to run before. And I think you ran about a half track and shut off. So, so you were pretty well set for the final. But once again, we were running awfully good, too. And, and I went up to the starting line, and I looked at it. And I picked the right lane. And, and I thought I was going to be just fine. And, and just for some reason or other, it just, uh, it just went up in smoke. I mean, I, I just, saw the films afterwards, it and it tried to leave, and then just started yeah. hazing the tires, and it just blew yeah, the tires and, off. It. And uh, it was unbelievable because we haven't, we have, you know, we weren't beaten quite some time. And uh, but to watch you go down through there and uh, cross the finish line first, uh, uh, there was a, I guess that was the only race in my entire career racing you that I didn't mind you winning, but yet that was the biggest race. state of shock oh yeah not well, only sure, usually didn't stay shocked when you went around well sure I see I had no, I didn't know Sunday afternoons I was never at the drag ship so I didn't know how it was to be in the final I remember you used to you used to, when you book your reservations to go home for your flight home you, you start from one o'clock in the afternoon every hour of course first round was at 12 30 that's right and I usually left at one <laughs> Well, McEwen right now is as tough as anybody out there. He won the 84 Big Bud shootout, ran 260 miles an hour. But in the early match race days, when you guys were out selling Hot Wheels toys for Mattel, <laughs> you beat him up so bad every weekend, but he never lost his sense of humor or spirit. <laughs> no, he didn't. He had to have one in those days. <laughs> and you whipped him. Uh, yeah, I know. We, we whipped him bad, uh, but, but I loved it. I, I love beating the mongoose and still do today. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I attacked drag racing a little bit more serious than he did. You know, McEwen was a more colorful guy and had a great time doing it, but uh, I had more of a great time beating him. Well, he showed us all that there was a business side to this sport, too, that maybe we didn't know. Oh, absolutely, yeah. McEwen really paved the way for, for a lot of racers today. Uh, uh, without a doubt, he's one of the best-known names in the sport. You had to beat him. Because if he won, you'd never live it down in the pits. I mean, he's brutal. Oh, he'd either run a cartoon in the newspapers <laughs> about how the mongoose beat the snake. I, I, everywhere I'd go, I'd have to he hear about it. So like you point out, I had to beat him. <laughs> well, he's a super guy, needless to say. But like you said, he did pioneer the, the sponsor st stage of things to come. And he's a really smart businessman and has a lot of good knowledge upstairs that he doesn't just give out all the time. You have to yeah. kind of pry it out of him. But when he does open up and tell you, he knows what's going on. You know, it seemed like every year a different guy or girl would win the Dragster World Championship. Not in funny cars. You owned it for four years. Then Beetle owned it for three, and Chi Town for two, and Bernstein's headed in that direction. You've told me earlier that it was the fuel system. That was your secret then. That's right. It's called a combination, and we had it in the fuel system, and we, and we dominated it for four years. But all along while we're doing it, someone else, in our case, the Blue Max, was our stiffest competition, had a combination they were working on, and it clicked. 
and it outperformed our combination, and they went ahead and won the championship a few years themselves. Now, if you went back and looked at the fuel system on the car that he won four years with, it would be archaic compared to what oh. you've got right here. <laughs> Well, certainly, this one will be archaic in a couple of years, but we're in the dual pump system, and it's really a, a good system because it can, can take care of the cylinders a lot better and put more fuel in the engine. And if you can put more fuel in it and burn the fuel, which then leads us to the three magnetos, you'll make more horsepower. More horsepower will mean you'll go faster and quicker, and that's the key, and that's what's happening. Of course, what's helping a lot of those areas is the computer that we have on the car to tell us what we need to do, and that is really the, the element that found that more than one magneto was needed. Actually, that was the thing that told us because the magneto was missing fire, cross-firing. So there's three on the car today. And Dale told me you can actually run the motor a little easier as far as ignition timing with three of them because it burns so much. Exactly. It burns the fuel in the cylinder. And again, whenever you can burn it and put the pro proper amount of air in the car, it should go faster. This guy has forced all of you to reevaluate just about everything you've got. Well, that's true, but uh, also uh, there's guys like Tim Gross that uh, won the Winter Nationals with one Magneto in his car and mm -hmm. ran 560s. And we've run over uh, 260 miles an hour with one Magneto, so it's just a combination. You know, some people believe that it ought to be this way, some others uh, the other way. But power is the main situation, and the fuel systems, and of course the spark blowers and let's not forget about trying to hook it up to the ground after you have all this yeah, power. Yeah, that's the nice part is you have all the power then you have to get it to the concrete and the asphalt and that's the hardest part to make it work because if it doesn't go there you don't go anywhere. There's a lot of research in the clutch department too. Oh, yeah. You know the clutch is a big key to these sure. things. When you hit the throttle and as Kenny can tell you with the situation on his car, uh, uh, the, it jumps right up. The RPMs go immediately up in the air, and of course the clutch has to take up all that slack and get it down the course without spinning the rear tires, and the computer is the thing that really showed him that. And when the scoreboard flashes those record numbers, Kenny, the crowd loves it. You should have heard the cheer when you ran 260 and 84 at Gainesville, right here. And they should have heard me scream at the other end, Steve, as happy as I was, and it was a good day for the Budweiser King. And on the elapsed time side, the first 560 we ever saw was in 1984 at the U.S. Nationals. Mark Oswald, red car in the near lane, 569, an official NHRA national record. And just a few months later at the winners back in California, Kenny, the quickest bunny car race of all time, you're in the far lane. What happened? Well, it's obvious right there. It was a heck of a race to half track, but then Rick Johnson just pulled away in the Hawaiian punch and put a 558 on us. And you ran a 567 even though your car went back into low gear. That's correct. We didn't get into high gear, but still, it was a tremendous run for Rick Johnson and the Hawaiian punch team. But there were better days coming for you at the 85 Gator Nationals in the far lane. Well, it was a good day again, and it seems like the Gators are our home racetrack for some reason. A Budweiser King sets a national record there. You were going for the speed record, and you got the elapsed time instead at 564. That's absolutely correct. We thought we'd get the speed record again, but the other one came up. Well, sitting with us is the man who did get the speed record. 1985, the world final, still the fastest funny car ride of all time in the Nearline Snake. Yeah, we ran that 264 mile an hour run at uh, Pomona. A tremendous run, and we, we were really pleased with it. You know, it's one thing to set a record, but it's another thing to come back and back it up. That's right, and you did that on that day. Both of you guys have experienced uh, the big bang when that car just explodes. And I know at the end of the racetrack working for Diamond P, when I watch those cars, I'm always expecting one or the other to maybe explode. What about in the car? Well, you don't think that in the car, obviously. You don't ever expect the car to blow up because it's not supposed to. It's supposed to make <laughs> it from one end of the right. quarter mile to the other without having that explosion. Uh, when it does, it is, is pretty ex exciting for you inside as well as outside. What about the first one after? The That's the hardest part right there. You hit the nail on the head, needless to say. To get in the car after a big explosion, and much like uh, uh, has happened in the past to me, that first run is the most difficult. Once that runs <laughs> under your belt, you're okay, but you're really low in the seat, you're tight as you can get, and I noticed, I remember kind of looking down over the dash a little bit, but once that one runs there, you're okay. Well, I've had a Quite a few bad ones, uh, Kenny pointed out. It, it really rattles your head. It's a violent explosion that goes on. But, you know, you're concentrating on just getting the car stopped. And coming back into it is uh, perhaps like a prize fighter after he's been knocked down and uh, uh, out of the fight. You have to think about it for a little while and get yourself together to come back again. 
You know, as far as major incidents happening at a single race, let's hope we never have an event that tops the 81 World Finals. Oh, that's the one we'll long remember. I lost the car there, and of course, Billy Myers. How about that fire, Myers? That, that started it off. <laughs> it's a rash of them there, but that happens at these events. Uh, uh, we were all going through a fuel system problem at the time. The air was super good, and went out there Sunday morning and went, it's going to be a rough day, guys. <laughs> you know, it's gonna, Boy, it's it cool here, and we're going to have to richen these motors up, and a lot of them are just too lean, and, yeah. and of course, that's where 90% of the fire comes from, is the lean conditions. Well, I'll tell you, you kept me busy just trying to report on all of them, particularly <laughs> Meyer. I have had a few uh, accidents, about three or four major ones, and they've all been at the finish line. However, the 81 World Finals was the one accident that the body stayed on the car. It was a completely different feeling. The other ones are bigger explosions, but when it explodes the body off the car, you feel a little safer real quick, but you can just climb out, with the exception of the fire. With this one, you feel more trapped, and it is more of a claustrophobic feeling. And uh, it was a good-sized fire, and uh, it's, you know, you finally get engulfed by the smoke, and you can't see, and it's a... Uh, there's some tension there, but the, as far as coming back after something like that, it's, you know, it's the old theory of falling off the horse. You just gotta climb right back on him and uh, hope he doesn't buck you off again. When you try new things like we do, and you try to stay ahead of the sport and aggressive, uh, then it's not always gonna work right. There's always, you know, there's always a little bit of chance, and if you average that out over as many runs as we've made, you know, the, the odds are pretty good in my favor. Anytime there's an accident, I'm, I'm a positive thinker. I think, ah, the guy's going to walk out. Yep, there he is. Tim Gross had one in Columbus, Ohio. I didn't think he'd walk away from him. Boy, did he. And there again, thank goodness it was nitromethane in the car, because as you recall, tremendous fire. He still had that fuel leaking out on the ground. If it had been gassing, he would have been in serious trouble. The part I remember the most about, obviously, is that when he came across the track, hit the guardrail, and rolled on top of the mm -hmm. guardrail, first thing I could think of was the guardrail getting inside the roll cage mm -hmm. with him. And, yeah, it was a, a tough one, the worst I've seen. You know, I looked at his fire suit later, and the guardrail had cut through all five layers and hadn't even broken the skin. Well, I knew what had caused the incident in 1980. Uh, the throttle was stuck. There was really not a whole lot I could do about it. I went to routinely backpedal, as we say in the business, where you back off the throttle some to tame the tire because it was spinning the tire a little bit, about 400 feet off the starting line. So I was traveling about 180 miles an hour, and uh, when I got on the guardrail, there was not a whole lot I could do other than tuck myself in and say the world's quickest prayer. I would have to say that with these cars as demanding as they are on the human mind and all that for, because of the acceleration we go through, the g-force that we encounter, the severe tire vibration, which really causes a lot of distractions on many occasions as you all might know. Uh, through all of that, I guess uh, you really put your blinders on and so I really there's, there's so much that happens within five and a half seconds. It's, it's pretty demanding, but uh, again, like I said, it's, it's never been a distraction. NASCAR racing, sprint car racing, even road racing, you expect a little contact here and there. Drag racing is supposed to be a non-contact sport. Absolutely. And boy, Ed McCullough and John Collins, classic example of why that's the most frightening thing that can happen. Oh, it was just a terrible accident, obviously. I was standing on the starting line watching them run at that particular day, and I saw it all happen, and I just walked away. I didn't even want to go look, of course, at all. I didn't want to think about it. I knew there was no way that someone wasn't hurt in that accident. I, you don't like to see that. Like you say, uh, drag racing is a non-contact sport. The 1984 Cajun Nationals will be a race that I'll remember for the rest of my life. Uh, Ed McCullough driving the light beer car and me driving the JVC car both left the starting line fairly even. Both cars were on a good run. I looked out the side window of my car approximately four to five hundred feet down the race course. You can see Ed McCullough. Uh, I turned back, hit my manual high speed, looked back over again just to check before I put my car in high gear. And at that point I could see Ed as close as maybe three or four feet to me at that point. 
Therefore, when on impact, when the car went upside down, I knew I had, uh, I didn't roll, but I had slid several hundred feet before the car finally come to a stop. I think that it would have had a, a, a much harder impact on me if, in fact, I hadn't have seen Ed come in contact with me when he did. Any kind of mishaps that I've had over the years, uh, obviously the, the incident with John Collins was by far the worst, but I've had fires and, you know, different things blowing blowers off many times. Uh, you don't think about that at all. I mean, you get in the car, you know what it is you have to do, you go out of the starting line, you concentrate on the lights, and, and, and you just go out there and do your job, and you don't think about any of the negative things at all. But as far as after effects that it's had on me, uh, sure, to this day, uh, when, I'm in the when I'm in qualifying, even in, uh, in eliminations, uh, a lot of times uh, I'm uh, a little uh, nervous about uh, possibly a guy that I haven't raced very many times. Uh, it, uh, it, it's not that it's the person that I'm racing, it's the effect that the, that the crash had on me, a, a driver with the capabilities of Ed McCullough. Uh, losing control like he did with his car just goes to show you that it can happen to anybody at any given t uh, time. So, yeah, I was I was aggravated at Ed, but I was so glad that both of us were alive and neither one of us were hurt. That's why I embraced him at the end of the track seconds after the uh, crash, was to let him know and, and both to relieve myself that, hey, we were both darn lucky that we were still standing up there with no injuries whatsoever. Okay, guys, enough of the uh, floppers of the past and the present. Uh, let's look into the crystal ball and maybe see the funny car of the future. Now, our friend uh, Kenny Youngblood, probably the best graphic artist we've ever met, uh, came up with this along with, uh, with Dale Armstrong, your guys. What do you think? Look at this thing. Oh, it looks a lot like a Pontiac Trans Am, wouldn't you say? <laughs> yeah, in your wildest dreams. Or maybe a Ford Tempo. Yeah, it you know, could. <laughs> and people watching the show may look at this and say, no, 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 no. We want funny cars that look like automobiles. That's what automobiles are going to look like pretty soon. That's look at the, the new Taurus and yeah. Sable from Ford. Exactly. I w I'm glad you said that because we've seen some pictures of the future cars, and they are like bubble cars, so to speak. And that's exactly what you see here, the enclosed wheels and tires. The whole idea is to get the wind to pass over the car give it the downforce that we need and not have as much drag. And obviously uh, the future is looking that way and, and uh, the funny car here is uh, portrayed that way and I wouldn't surprise me it'll be that way. Okay, let's look at a silhouette that Kenny created here with the same car, looking at it from his side. Well, the most uh, unique thing about that is having the front mounted supercharger, which uh, at safety alone, it'll be Let's nice. Look at the that supercharger right here. will be sitting out in front of the engine instead of on top. Which, now, dra dragsters years ago used to do that. That's ex that, when I first started out, they had uh, front mounted blowers. So who knows? It'll come back to that. You know, something else, Kenny, that's interesting here is no fuel is being passed through the blower, it's just pumping air. Exactly. Yeah, it's a super idea. Uh, it'll probably happen. Knowing Armstrong, it will. <laughs> what about these exhaust headers? What's going on here, Don? Well, they're sucking the air out underneath the car, is what's happening, using the force of the exhaust system to actually go through some tubes to suck the air out underneath the car, which in effect is a ground effect system. Mm -hmm. Well, ground effects have got to come about. Every time you run, both of you, the tire is spinning the whole way down the racetrack. It's just not smoking. Absolutely. It is, it is turning the tire, and the whole key is ground effects. I think that's probably the next logical step that all the funny cars will get to, and this is certainly the way to do it. If we can keep the air out from under the car, it'll go quicker and faster. It's just as obvious as can be. Trans Am's done it, Can Am cars, Indy cars. All of them have done it, and this is no exception here. Be more downforce and less drag. That is a key issue in racing. Don't need a wind tunnel to tell that that is one slippery piece of equipment. Might be here here uh, sooner than what you think. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I want to thank you guys. I've had a great afternoon here at your shop. We've talked about a lot of our old friends, a lot of yeah. exciting times. There's some scary moments as well that uh, everyone has survived, thank God. Right. And I look forward to doing this again, maybe when this machine finally evolves. Well, Steve, I've certainly enjoyed it also, and I'm looking forward to the future. Don, thank you. Let's do it again.
want the best seat in the house for the hottest motorsports action? Then choose from over 40 spectacular titles in the Diamond P Motorsports Action Catalog. No collection is complete without the hottest selling action video series available anywhere, and they walked away. In all four and they walked away videos, you'll thrill to the awesome power of top fuel dragsters and funny cars unleashed and out of control. The chills and spills of motorcycles, speeding stock cars, and high flying monster truck mayhem. You'll jump out of your chair with a nerve tingling adventure of unlimited hydroplane racing included in that before. And in each bone-jarring incident, the driver walked away. Drag racing fans will recapture all the exciting moments of the season in Diamond P's Drag Racing Yearly Review. Relive each year of the Blazing Streetliners from Drag 86 through Drag 95 as NHRA's top drivers compete for the coveted championship crown. Call the 24-hour hotline number on your screen and order from our special series of biographies on some of motorsport's most dominant legends, like drag racing's undisputed record setter, Kenny Bernstein, the king of speed. You show me someone that enjoys losing, I'll show you someone that's never won. It's that simple. Meet the force behind the Liquid Oval's most prolific team, Bernie Little, Mr. Unlimited, and his quest to become Unlimited Hydroplane Racing's winningest team with the Miss Budweiser. And the nightmare continues with the man whose every pass down the track is nothing short of an amusement park thrill ride. John Force, still the one, is wall-to-wall -wall excitement as well as candid interviews. I have all the fear in the world. I have all the respect for this hot rod because it can hurt you. Still not full? Still craving more action? Then call the number on your screen and get the catalog. Inside, it's full of action videos, including the Shake Battle and Roll series. The videos that will satisfy your need for gritty, roaring monster truck and mud racing drama, four-wheel and off-road jamboree excitement, and the exciting car-crushing monster truck thunder drag series. One more? You'll find that not every awesome fire, flip, and tumble is unexpected. In Joey Chitwood 50 Years of Thunder, you'll experience precision stunts and death-defying feats from the most legendary thrill show on wheels. If you're into speed and looking good, then you'll definitely want the best of Hot Rods 2, featuring some of the slickest, tricked-out speedsters. Towering 4x4s and slamming and jamming high-performance workhorses, and of course, those thundering hogs. If you're looking to round out your drag racing package, don't miss 40 Years of the U.S. Nationals, an in-depth look at the evolution of the sport and its heroes at one of drag racing's crown jewel events. For practical tips and expert instruction on how to make your racing dreams a reality, pick up your copy of From Street to Strip, with legendary racer and instructor Frank Holly. Learn the tricks and know-how it takes to become a competitive drag racer. Call the 24-hour hotline number on your screen to order any of these videos and the exciting Diamond P video catalog. Inside, you'll find special action and collector video packages that will fill your tape racks and save you money. Diamond P Sports has been your ticket to the best seat in motorsports for over 20 years. And the whole Diamond P Action Library is at your fingertips by calling now.